Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here. We'll go ahead and get started with some announcements. Uh, I want to encourage you to pick up a bulletin uh, that's in the foyer. It has a lot of uh, details, a lot more than what I'm going to mention, so it's a good resource to you. Uh, first of all, I want to let you know if you're a visitor here that we appreciate you being here. Members too, but visitors are special to us, so I um, want to uh, encourage you to, to come back as much as you can and, and be a part of, of what we do here. Um, today's date is 123-123-123, so write that down and look at it and think about it. Kind of neat. Always remember those that are on our prayer list that need prayers. Just a few highlights. Sharon Thomas uh, is still suffering quite a bit with her rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, they said that she was moved to Ridgecrest, so please continue to keep her in your prayers. Eva Looper is still at uh, Flo and Phil Hospice House, room 106, um, not waking up and um, having some apnea in between her breaths, so usually that means things are at the last stage. Is there any other update on that? I haven't heard in about a day or so. Okay, so again, keep them in your prayers. Carlene and Joe Brewer's son, Sean Steele, passed away. The visitation will be at 10 o'clock, service at 11 o'clock on Tuesday. And that is at Emerson Funeral Home. So keep the Brewer family in your prayer. Uh, today is the fifth Sunday contribution. So um, give as much as you can, uh, be prayerful about your contribution, um, and think of all the things that God has done for us, um, and hopefully um, we can work a lot closer to getting this uh, particular note paid off, if not completely today. Um, so keep that in your thoughts as we get to that part of our worship. There will be a New Year's Eve youth devo at Tyler and John Along's home this evening. It starts at 5 p.m. It goes till 5 p.m. the next day. No? no? Okay. <laughs> starts at 5 p.m. We'll leave it there. Um, got any questions you ask uh, Tyler? We'll be preparing a meal for the Brewer family on Tuesday. Um, so uh, still use extra side dish and chicken spaghetti, things like that. So if you can help, please see Jamie. Uh, and a little note on that, all the foods need to be at the building by 11 o'clock. The Almonds and Poes will be taking a group of teens to the YOU Youth Rally in Conway. That will be January 19th, 20th, and 21st. Um, registration is $35. It includes a t-shirt. Housing is provided, but uh, they will need money for meals. And today is the deadline to sign up for that, so see Jamie with any questions. Uh, another reminder about Grace Point's first community gospel singing night will be January the 14th at 5 p.m. There are flyers in the foyer, so if you can, please grab some of those and hand those out and post them places so more people are aware and uh, we can have more attendance with that. Also, please remember... Uh, there will be a new adult Bible class in the auditorium beginning next Sunday morning. Um, it will be studying the book of James. So if you're not currently in a Bible class, we would uh, encourage you to, to come and be a part of that. Is there anything else that needs to be said or done before we start this morning? No. Okay. Um, so this morning, Greg Hope will lead our singing. Tyler Long will have our opening prayer. Chase Allman. Uh, has children's time. Michael Horton will have our scripture reading. Bill Ballard will have the Lord's Supper prayer, and Craig Cup will have the closing prayer. So at this time we'll start worship uh, with prayer to God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and all the many blessings in it. We ask that you be with all of those that are sick and ailing and helping it back to the much wanted needed health if it be thy will and we ask a special blessing be on the brewers right now as they go through this difficult time and we ask that you comfort them in a way that only you can and we ask that you be with the church here at grace point as we strive every day to carry out your will and do it in a manner that's pleasing unto thee and 
We ask that you be with the elders and the deacons here and help them to lead this church in a manner that's pleasing unto thee. And please forgive us when we fail thee and give us a home in heaven within the end. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, our first song will be number 532. We'll sing all four stanzas. <clears throat> all people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with fear, his praise for tell. Come ye before him and rejoice. The Lord ye know is God indeed. Without our aid he did us make. We are his flock, he doth us feed. And for his sheep he doth us take. O oh, enter then his gates with praise. Approach with joy his courts unto. Praise Lord and bless his name always. For it is seemly so to do. For why the Lord our God is good, his mercy is for children's time come on up any kids sixth grade and under are welcome to come forward at this time members guests alike we put out a bucket they put some money in it if they got it we'll put that towards the needs of the kids in the area the last thing we did with it was we sponsored foster children and we took care of their christmas lists we always do something special with that money this time is a short time of devotion and prayer hey mr evan yo come on up good job everyone all right, y'all get where you can see me. Got an important lesson for you. Good job, everyone. All right, who can tell me how do you become the greatest person on earth? What are some things you can do? Oh, Sadie might be getting ahead of us. What did Sadie say? You obey God. That's important. What else, Ariane? You do what God says. Anyone else? Evan? Um, pray for your family to God. Mm, pray for your family to God. Yes, very important. You guys are too smart. You guys are too good. How does, all right, here's a tough question. How does the world measure greatness? Who does the world think is great? What makes someone great according to the Earth's standards. How wealthy you are, yeah. What else? Same thing, money and power, yeah. What? Listening to God. Yeah, listening to God's better than that. Oh, picking up trash. You could be a good person, yeah. You could be a good earthly person too. Well, we're having a lesson today where there's a really good man on earth who did a lot of good things, but Jesus says, if you want to be greater than him, all you have to do is be a what? 
You have to be a Christian. If you want to be better than the most powerful, most rich person on earth, the best that we can do, all you have to do is be a Christian. And you don't even have to be that good of a Christian. You just have to be with Jesus and he takes care of the rest. And then you can be greater than the greatest person on earth. And you can say, I'm the greatest on earth. You probably shouldn't say that, but you can be. Because being with Jesus is the only thing that matters, right? You guys knew it before I even said anything. You said, praying to God, obeying God, being a Christian, that's how you become great. Your parents are doing a wonderful job. But it's a really important lesson because for some reason when you get older, you forget that. You guys may know it, but us grown-ups forget that. We want a better car, a better house, better clothes. We want to take care of you guys. But the most important thing is being a Christian. Can you all pray with me real quick? Can you hold your hands, bow your head? You guys repeat after me. Dear God, we love you. Please help us to remember the greatness of being a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen. All his wonderful passion and purity, may his spirit divine, all my being refine, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. Number 396. <clears throat> 396, we'll sing all three stanzas. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one, no, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. No night so dark but his love can cheer us. Not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Our song before the Lord's Supper will be number 386. <clears throat> 386.
We'll sing the first and third stanza. Why did the Savior heavenly that come to earth below, where men his grace would not receive, because he loved me so? He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me because he loved me so. Why feel the gardener's dreadful dross? Why through his trials go? Why suffer death upon the cross? Because he loves me so. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me, because he loves me so. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're so thankful that we could gather here today with like-minded Christians and to study thy word. Dear Lord, we're, as we surround your table, dear Lord, help us to clear our minds of all the earthly things and help us to concentrate on the sacrifice that Jesus made. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for that sacrifice. And dear Lord, as we partake of this loaf, which represents his body on the cross, help us to take it in a manner that will be well-pleasing to thee. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. Dear Lord, we're so thankful that you loved us, loved us enough to send your Son to die for our sins. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for the sacrifice that he made. Dear Lord, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood that was shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, help us to take it in a manner that will be well-pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you now thanking you for all the earthly blessings you've blessed us with. Dear Lord, we are a blessed people. And dear Lord, as we give back a portion of that that you've so richly blessed us with, help us to do it for loving and cheerful heart. Dear Lord, help us to remember that we are stu stewards of those blessings. And dear Lord, as we give back, dear Lord, we ask that the funds be used to help spread your word throughout the community and throughout the world, dear Lord. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Our next song is number 389, <clears throat> 389. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was. Weary and worn and sad, I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus saying, Behold, I freely give the living water thirsty one stoop down and drink and live i came to jesus and i drank of that life-giving stream my thirst was quenched my soul revived and now I live with him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I look to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun, and in that light of life I walk till traveling days are done. Our next song is number 694. If you would stand for this song, we'll sing it through twice and then we'll have our scripture reading and our sermon <clears throat> number 694 <clears throat> Lord, may 
servant, do what you must do to make me a servant, make me like you. Our scripture reading this morning will be taken from the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 24 through 28. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. You may be seated. So good to be with you again, as it is every week. I hope you're glad to be here. Uh, I'm a little sick of y'all, though, so I'm going to take a year off. I'll see you in 2024, though. <laughs> last sermon of the year, last day of the year. Hopefully you've got your affairs in order for a good 2024, Lord willing. If we see 2024, I don't care whether we do or not, but I'm going to try and live my life a point of the way I should while I'm here so that one day I can join him in eternity, and I know that's what you're looking forward to as well. Well, today we've got a lot going on. I, I told the men to try and count the numbers so I can announce it. I can't count as fast as they do. Good old Arkansas education. We'll see how quick they get that number up. Hopefully we took care of that note, and if we didn't, we'll take care of it in the, uh, the week or the next week after that, the month or the next month. We'll take care of it. I know we will. I've got a few good things to announce. Uh, it's New Year's. Happy New Year. Hopefully you've got plans with your family or, or just a peaceful night at home. You can celebrate the way that you'd like to celebrate. Next year, we're going to begin a three-month series of a second Sunday singing night. This is a congregational area-wide singing. This is a, 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 a real deal singing night. We're going to bring in some pros, some guys that are better than me singing. Should be a really encouraging night. January 14th is the first night of those singing nights, so plan to come to that. Grab one of those green pieces of paper and give it to your uh, favorite church family that you think would be encouraged by it, favorite visitor as well, bring someone to it. But I'm glad you're all here. And, and one of my honors that I always enjoy announcing is when someone decides to officially become a member at Grace Point. Uh, we think you're good enough to join us, no matter how bad you are, so we let just about anyone in. <laughs> Someone who is far above that mark is the Cullens. The Cullens have decided to place membership with us. They've been here for a while. They've hemmed and hawed about it a little bit, and they thought we're good enough to be their official church family. So Colby and Dana, Josie, Asa, and Delta, we are proud to have them as a part of the Grace Point family. Officially, we welcome them. If you haven't met them somehow, be sure to encourage them. Welcome them officially. That just means they're in the directory now, essentially. We're glad to have them. He's been fixing the air conditioners when they've been going out, so he really is a valuable member. Amen. We're glad you're here today. We're concluding uh, our series on John the Baptist. I've really been encouraged by this series. Hopefully you have been as well. I wanted to end the year by encouraging you to tell people about Jesus. And we've been looking at John the Baptist as a man who did exactly that. In his own weird and beautiful, unique way, he unabashedly, unashamedly, courageously preached the truth about Jesus. That was all he cared about. That's all he wanted to do. And so many times in my own life, I get distracted. Uh, some uh, good distractions, things I do need to care for and tend to, but I get off course. And I don't, as I need to, tell people about Jesus or even to the degree to which I need to tell people about Jesus. So I wanted to encourage us to do exactly that. And finally today, we're going to try to close the book on John's story. We've got a lot to cover here. I'm going to try and read more than talk. Uh, let the Bible speak for itself, and I'll interject a few thoughts about it. But go home, read the conclusion of John's life on your own, so you can really dig deeper into it. 
There are so many complex lessons in the end of John's life and what Jesus says about John the Baptist that hold a lot of truth and encouragement for you that I don't think I'll be able to cover completely here. Uh, but I want us to see as John's life ends the legacy that John leaves behind. And really in truth, and I really want to underscore this before we begin the lesson so that you can apply this to your own life, John's legacy truthfully is not the legacy of John. As great as he was and as famous as he is and how, uh, how he did something impossible that I or no one could ever do, the legacy of John the Baptist is the legacy of Christ. Because the life of John the Baptist was dedicated to the life of Christ. So that as he left the earth, the mark that he left on the earth was telling people about Jesus. His legacy is a continuation of Jesus' legacy. Not that they're in competition with one another. Christ is far superior, obviously. But John says, I'm going to align my life with Christ in such a way that even my death points to him. And there's a lot of really scary similarities between the death of John and the death of Jesus as well, martyred for speaking the truth as he was and as we'll see shortly. But I wonder what John would tell you today. I wonder what John would tell me today. As we hem and haw and make excuses as to why we're not as evangelistic as we could be, why we don't tell our friends and family and neighbors about Jesus when the opportunity's directly in front of us, I wonder what John would tell us. He, he's pretty passionate, so he may raise his voice at you. He may line you out. But I think, very plainly, John would tell us, speak the truth. And when you do it, do it with your chest held high. Don't hang your head ba bowed low. Don't mumble. Don't chew on your words. Don't present the gospel as if you're ashamed of the gospel. Too many Christians do that, I'm afraid. And I'll raise my hand, sometimes I am as well. Yes, I'm a preacher. Yes, I Church of Christ. Yes. Because I... I I'm afraid almost of what they feel about me before I even speak to them at all, as if I matter in the equation at all, instead of telling people about Jesus, who matters more than anyone else. I wonder what John would say to me. I wonder what John would say to you. Pick up the sword, brother. Pick up the word, sister. Never underestimate the message of Jesus. It's all people need. Well, as we continue in John's life, let's see now a part of John's life he probably didn't enjoy particularly. John is placed in prison. He speaks the truth, and speaking the truth gets you in trouble no matter what day and age it is. John was so committed to speaking the truth, he wouldn't relent. He was put in prison for that. Now, at, there's a really seemingly difficult passage here as John is in prison. Contextually, if you remember, back in John 1, a few lessons ago, John declares and tells the, the crowds, Behold the Lamb of God. He sees Jesus and he says, This is the Messiah. This is the guy I told you about. This is him. Behold the Lamb of God. Later, he would say famously in a lesson we covered recently, He must become greater. I must become less. This is the one born of God. I saw the Spirit descend on him. But now we see John in prison. After we establish, he recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. We now see him in prison in uh, Matthew 11, and we're going to look at Luke 7. Similar accounts here. John sends disciples to Jesus since he can't talk to him since he's in prison. And the disciples ask Jesus, are you the one to come or should we expect another? Is John doubting in this moment? John, you just affirmed that Jesus is the Messiah. You baptized him yourself. You had this great, fantastic, miraculous moment in your own life. And now, are you second-guessing that? Are you wondering if Jesus really is the one, or is there something more to that? Really challenging point here as we see John's vulnerability here in prison, and we see his, this difficult thing here. So what's really happening? I'm going to present it to you, and you can find the answer for yourself. Perhaps there's two... Uh, theories that rise above any other, and we'll discuss those. But first, let's see John in prison. Let's look at Luke 8, 18 through 23, and then we'll continue in Luke 7 if you're already there. Luke 7, 18 through 23. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent, sent them to the Lord, saying, this is John's message to Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the man had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look to another? They relayed the message. 
In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus, that's not really a straight answer. I asked you if you're the one, and you pointed to the miracles you did. Really, Jesus is saying, yes, I am the one. Go and tell John what you have seen and what you have heard. So there's two theories here. Why in the world did John the Baptist send his disciples to Jesus to ask him, are you the one, or shall we wait for another? Is there another coming after you that is the Messiah? Are you not the Messiah? The first theory, John doubted. John was so negatively affected by his circumstances that for a moment, no matter how brief, he wondered, is Jesus really who I thought he was? Is he truly the Messiah? We see a bit of honest doubt from John, honest questioning from John. He didn't lose his faith entirely, but he just wanted some reassurance. He had been thrown in prison by Herod. He likely knew how that was going to end. He knew he wasn't favored by the world, certainly by those in power. He knew the message he's been speaking about Herod, and we'll cover that in this lesson. He had told the crowd, the Messiah is coming. He told some that the axe is laid at the roots of the trees. Judgment is coming. You need to repent now. Now, jump ahead. Luke 7, John, you're in prison. There's no axe. There's no fire. There's no judgment. You said he was bringing the kingdom. John, there's no kingdom. Maybe... There's no Messiah. It's easy to see how John could have been discouraged here. And we can't beat him up for doubting. He may not have even been doubting. He just asked a question. How many questions or doubts do you present to the Lord? I know mine. There's a long list. John just doubted for a moment, just questioned for a moment. That's the first theory. So he sent his disciples, are you the one? Let's affirm the doubt. Let's get the answer to that. The second theory, John's question, are you the one, was not for his benefit, but rather for the benefit of his disciples. And that's what we see next. That's the second theory. John wasn't doubting at all, but instead he used the moment to teach his disciples a lesson. So he sends his disciples, who themselves may have been doubting about Jesus. They already uh, were competitive with Jesus. John, why aren't you getting the crowds instead of Jesus getting the crowds? Uh, He's baptizing so many. Are you worried by his success? So maybe his disciples were doubting, and John, instead of telling them the truth again, because they couldn't get the truth through, they were so stubborn, he said, just go listen to Jesus. Go ask him if he's the one for your own benefit. I know he's the one, but you won't listen to me, so you guys go to him and get the answer for yourselves. Uh, So Jesus sends the disciples back to John. John's disciples go back to John. Tell him what you have seen and what you have heard. And he lists the long list of miracles, which in and of themselves were fulfillments of prophecy. The blind can see, the deaf can hear, the poor are hearing the gospel. Exactly, John, what you want to happen is happening. I'm the one doing these things. I'm the Messiah. So he sends them back with this message. But notice, throughout this entire thing, and this can be a big encouragement for me and you, Jesus does not rebuke John for his question. He never says, John... Oh, you of little faith, how did you doubt? Of course, I'm I'm the Messiah. You saw me being baptized. Maybe that shows us that John never truly doubted, and Jesus knew that as well, and Jesus played the part of teaching John's disciples the lesson. Or maybe Jesus knew John's in torment right now. He's imprisoned for speaking the truth. One of the worst things I think can happen to a person, doing what's right and then being punished for it. Jesus doesn't rebuke John, but he responds with compassion. And he directs John's disciples to the answer in the most profound way possible. It is one thing for Jesus to say verbally, I am the Messiah. And he does. The the Father and I are one. 
I come from the Father because he sent me. The message that I speak is my Father's message. He always reaffirms his power, his authority, his message. People still ignore that today. But one thing Jesus knew, John's disciples and John could not ignore, is what's in front of them. What do you see? What do you hear? What am I doing? What does Jesus do for your life and for the life of the people in the world around you? That's a better witness and better testimony to our ignorant minds than the very word from Jesus himself. If I tell you, the lowly man that I am, Jesus is the answer for your life, you won't listen to me until you experience Jesus yourself. So Jesus knew that. So he gave them the most profound answer. Look at what I'm doing and you will know that I am him. So the disciples return and either John was incredibly encouraged in that moment, knowing, yes, okay, he is the Messiah. And he almost, you can visually see a sigh of relief escape John in this moment. It was all not for nothing. He is who I knew him to be. Or John says, see, I told you so. And he encouraged in this moment the disciples that were following him and further encouraged them to leave him and go to Jesus. It's always been about Jesus this entire time. You guys have clung close to me, and I love your ministry so much. I'm stuck here. Go to him. He's the Messiah. So either theory one or theory two, you choose. I think you could argue almost equally for either one, that John needed the encouragement in the moment, or the disciples needed instruction, or both. It's encouraging for John, and it's a great lesson for his disciples as well. I know I would have a lot of questions in John's place as well here in prison. But Jesus continues. After speaking to John's disciples, tell him what you've seen and heard, go back to him, encourage him, encourage yourselves. Jesus now turns to the crowds and addresses the crowds about the man, John the Baptist. And in this moment, Jesus praises John in a, a, an effort to educate the crowds and reveal to them the true value that John was and what they had lost that they had. John was a powerful prophet, a mighty man, and now he's gone and you have ignored him. You thought he was a fool. You thought he was a reed. And, and we'll get into that as Jesus now praises John. High praise. Jesus says, yes, he was a prophet, even more than a prophet. The greatest born among Man is John the Baptist. High praise from Jesus. I would love to hear the same things from Jesus said of me, wouldn't you? So well, let's see, as Jesus affirms John's mission in God's plan and praises John in his ministry and in his teachings, his life, let's see what Jesus says about John to the crowds and how they needed to learn the lesson about who John was and his mission. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind, a timid man, a scared man. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in the king's courts, almost pointing the finger to the group in the audience that very well known, the Pharisees, the tax collectors, the scribes. What then did you go out to see? The same question a third time. A prophet? Yes! And I'll tell you, not just a prophet, more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. John says, I was the messenger that was prophesied. Now Jesus is reaffirming that. He is the messenger, the forerunner that was prophesied. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. He's the pinnacle. He's it. High praise from Jesus. And yet, Jesus says, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard this, I love how Luke reveals the intentions of the crowds. The tax collectors heard this too. They declared God just because they too were baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves because they had not been baptized by him. They rejected John. They were rejecting Jesus. The Gentiles, the tax collectors, the sinners had accepted this message, so they rejoiced. So Jesus says, now about the audience, about the crowd, to what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? You rejected John, now you're rejecting me. They're like children 
sitting in the marketplace, calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you said about him he has a demon. And now I, the Son of Man, has come eating and drinking, and you say of me, look at him, a glutton, a drunkard, friend of tax collectors and sinners. Wisdom, Jesus says, is justified by all her children. And you, dear audience members, are not the children of wisdom. What would you go to John for? What did you go to him to hear? He spoke words of life to you. He spoke words of repentance to you. And those who had accepted it rejoiced in that moment because they had the life that John, Jesus revealed by John. But those who had rejected it, Jesus now reveals, are like foolish children. A lot of people rejected John the Baptist. He was in prison now because those in power rejected John's message. And those same people that would reject the forerunner of Christ, obviously, were going to reject Christ. John was set to prepare the way for Jesus, prepare the wilderness. And we saw in that lesson that it was the hearts of Israel, not the location of Israel, that John was sent to prepare. And those who accepted the preparation would accept Jesus, and those who rejected John's message would reject Jesus. John was noble and valuable. He's better than all of you high and mighty people with your fine clothing, with your rich affair, presenting the proper image of a priest that John forsook in his life, wearing the clothes that he wore, the life that he led. He's better than you are. Anything the world has to offer, John is better than. But then in the middle of praising John with some of the best praise a man could ever receive, the best praise, Jesus says, but he's not that valuable. In fact, if you want to be greater than the greatest man the world has to offer, be the least in the kingdom of God. The one who is least in the kingdom of God, Jesus says, is greater than him. And I just called him the best. The least born of Christ is superior to the greatest born of woman, born of mankind. The best of the flesh will never be superior to anything of the Spirit, even the least. And if you get too deep into the weeds, you really uh, get lost wondering wh what does it mean to be the best born of the flesh and what does it mean to be the least born of the Spirit and are there levels to those born in the Spirit, those greater and those below? Don't get lost in that. Just recognize very simply, no matter what you accomplish in this life, the only thing that matters is that you have Christ. Amen. You heard me, but you haven't heard me. Because I don't live like that. And I know most of you don't either. And God forgives sinners, thankfully, and we're all sinners, so we all got God's grace. But we live, I live, I won't throw you under the bus anymore, I live for the success of the flesh far too often. I want to be, uh, not the greatest, I don't care about that, but I'd like to be great in the flesh, I'd like to be good in the flesh, I'd like to have some success, some level of comfort. And if we focus on that too much, we lose the significance of the value of Christ. Jesus says, the one born of me, is better than the one greatest, born of women. No matter who it is that you attribute value to in this earth, he doesn't compare at all to the least in my kingdom. Going to heaven with Christ with the least is better than dying without Christ with the most. You can be the greatest or most deserving man on this earth. Hey, Pharisees, I'm looking at you. Hey, people who are high and mighty, I'm looking at you. Do all the works and the deeds of this life that attribute greatness to yourself and lose Christ and you've lost it all. Hey, undeserving Gentiles. Hey, tax collectors. Hey, you whom would be shunned by the temple. Those of you who don't deserve to come to church because you're not living right. You are greater than all of those hypocrites if you have me. That's the distinction. If you don't have Christ, hey, you're great or you're not and that's it. If you do have Christ, you have Christ. 
And that's all that mattered. John knew that, and he tried to convince people of that, and they rejected him. Jesus knew that, and now he continues his ministry, telling people the same. You don't have to be as great as John. You can't even if you try. Jesus sets the bar. John's at the top. But you don't have to be as good as him. You can be the worst Christian possible, but as long as you're a Christian, you're better than anything else this world has to offer. That doesn't mean try and be the worst Christian. You still stick to your spiritual disciplines and try and be as faithful as you can, recognizing I'm not great, I'm not lowly, I'm in Christ. And that's all that matters. John knew that, and he would die knowing that. The last thing we see as we try and conclude John's life is John's commitment to the truth. And I intentionally put this instead of saying John's beheading. It's a terrible tragedy that John the Baptist is beheaded. You likely know the story. But instead of focusing on the loss of John, I want us to focus on the victory of John and John's commitment to the truth. I've never really thought about this too much before, but I think I can confidently say even though John ended by being executed, I think he would have been proud of his decision. I think he was okay with it. In the moment, maybe he would have traded it for freedom. Maybe not a beheading is what John would like to do. But now, since he was in Christ and he's in the kingdom of God, cut my head off, I don't care. I'm proud of my decision of being committed to the truth. This entire time, we've seen John's humility. Exalting Christ is what he's all about, but he would never sacrifice the truth. He wouldn't even bend the truth. John's commitment to speaking the truth is all that he cared about, even unto the end. Now, don't ask me why God did not deliver John. Because I don't know. Don't ask me whether or not John could have better served the kingdom of God, whether he was free from prison or not, because I don't know. If I was in charge, I would have freed John. But God's in charge, and John's time was up. That's all there is to it. Again, I think John's happy with that decision. I think John's okay with God having the sovereignty over his life. It doesn't matter when God allowed John's life to be taken, or even if he didn't. John got to heaven, and that's all that matters. God's in charge. I don't know the answer. That's the answer. God's in charge. It's up to him. Instead of focusing on the loss of John, focus instead on his commitment to the truth, on the victory that John won. I'm sure John's proud of it. Look at now, we'll jump to Mark 6 and see Mark's account as he details the end of John. And I wanted to contextualize this, so I'll try and read quickly, just so I don't take it out of context and you miss something. 14 through 29 of Mark 6. King Herod heard of it, about the message of Jesus being proclaimed in the kingdom. Jesus' name had become known. And some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I'm, I have beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted, him to, wanted to put him to death. But she could not. For Herod, doesn't get much credit, but he gets some credit, Herod feared John, knowing John was a righteous and holy man, and Herod kept him safe. When he had heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And Herodias said, the head of John the Baptist, the one who embarrasses me so much. And she came in immediately with haste to the king, asking and saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths, whatever those meant, and because his guests that were around him, that meant more than his oaths, he did not want to break his word to her. 
And immediately the king sent an executioner with order to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison. And he brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her, her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The end of John the Baptist. What's that saying about a, a woman scorned? Herod would tolerate John, but Herodias would not. And John here shows us a powerful picture of courage. He's speaking out against the governing powers of his land. I don't care who you are, John says. If you're not speaking in line with the truth, I have to speak out against it. I don't care who you are. Sleeping with your brother's wife is wrong. You've offended me. Imprisonment. Herod, at least, to his credit, recognized the power that John had. He's some kind of prophet. I'm perplexed at him. I'm confused. I don't totally understand what he means, but he listened to him gladly. He liked the words that he said. Maybe, eventually, John could have persuaded Herod, and Herod would have freed John. That was seemingly Herod's plan. Uh, maybe not even John's freedom, but he wouldn't have killed him. Just let him live in prison quietly so he doesn't embarrass me or my wife even further. But Herodias wouldn't let go of the grudge. John had embarrassed her, the fornicator, the adulterer, the brother's wife who was now married to Herod. She couldn't let it stand, so she sent and got him beheaded. In the face of opposition to the truth, John stood firm to the end, and what he reveals there in that moment is the true potential cost of authentic discipleship. If your discipleship is not authentic, you likely will, ne will never have to bear this cross. You likely will never have to pay this cost. But if your truth is part of who you are, if God's message is part of your life, and you face opposition to that, you'll never bow in the face of opposition. And if someone has physical authority over you, you may have to face physical consequences for your spiritual dedication. But in the face of opposition, John stood strong. And Herod's decision to execute John serves as a reminder to us, hey, this whole Christianity thing is deadly serious. It's physically serious as well as, more importantly, spiritually serious. There are sometimes physical consequences. And maybe if I was in John's shoes, I would have bent the truth a little bit. Maybe I, there's grace for you, Herod. There's forgiveness for you, Herod. This isn't right, but I'm not going to publicly denounce you anymore. So now, thinking that I've won a victory, I'm going to go back into the wilderness so that I can be free to preach the gospel. And maybe in my mind, I've tipped the scales back in my favor because this small little white lie is now outweighed by the great works that I'm doing for God's kingdom. John didn't play that game at all for a second. I'm not going to bend the truth. No matter who you are, no matter what power you have, no matter what consequences I may face, it's the truth. I was born for this purpose. I'm living for this purpose. I might as well die for this purpose. Herod, what you're doing is wrong. Herodias, what you're doing is wrong. And for that, John lost his life. You may not be called to be executed one day for speaking the truth. But do you make any sacrifices for the truth? Do I make any sacrifices for the truth? Am I even okay with being uncomfortable in a relationship I have with a sinful person by revealing that the way they're living their life is sinful? Or do I just bend the truth in that moment so that I don't have an uncomfortable relationship? So that my work life is not complicated by my faith? Can I just have the best of both worlds, God? Can I just be your faithful son or daughter while I'm here among faithful sons and daughters? And can I be, not worldly, not a sinner, but can I just get along with the world when I'm among the world? Do you make any sacrifices for the truth? That's a question you've got to answer for yourself. If you look at John, John would tell you. Don't give up the truth. Instead of sacrificing the truth, John essentially sacrificed himself. My life is not more valuable than the truth. That's what John would say. I don't know if Chase could say that. I really like my life. But the truth matters more. 
Are you willing, as John did, to stand firm to the very end, no matter what happens? And again, your consequences, I don't think, will ever come to the point of John's consequences. I don't know if public speech will bring your imprisonment and later your execution. It may come to that. And even if it comes to that, John would say, keep going. Stand firm, chest held high, speaking the truth as loudly as you can to as many people as you can. Are you devoted to that? Are you dedicated to do that? Hey, can you decide today, I'm going to tell people about Jesus in my own way, in my own unique way. I don't have to be John the Baptist. I can't be as great as, as him even if I tried. But I, Chase Allman, me individually, state your name, I am dedicated to Christ, his message, his truth, his gospel, because I'm certainly dedicated to his salvation. I certainly want to go to heaven. So I'm going to accept willingly all of the things that go along with that because it's worth it. That's the message of John's life, and that's the legacy that John leaves behind. And again, beautifully, we see John's legacy uniting with Christ's legacy. John wouldn't divert his own legacy or claim superiority in any kind, even if it meant his physical survival. It was all about Christ ever since he was born to the time that he died. That's the example he sets for us. And the scriptures invite us to speak out, and unfortunately, they don't just invite us, they command us. They tell you to share the gospel with the world around you. I hope the example of John the Baptist can encourage you as we see this powerful man speaking the truth no matter what to the very end. I hope that it can, it can encourage you. If you look forward to the year, whatever it means for a calendar year to happen, it's just another day. You should be as devoted to Jesus today as you would for any New Year's resolution or any other goal that you have. But if you do need to rededicate yourself, as John did many times, to speak the truth, today's a good day to do it. If you're outside of Christ and you haven't been baptized, that's what John died for, to save the world around him. That's what Jesus ultimately died for, to save you, to bring you into him so that you can be greater than the greatest person the world has to offer, even if you're the least of the kingdom, even if you're a struggling Christian whose inner turmoil is powerful and you feel like you can't do it alone, the good news is that you don't have to. God is here for you. Jesus is here for you. The Spirit intercedes for you. And that is all at your disposal if you're baptized into Christ, putting off your old sinful self of death. If you need to be baptized today, or you just need the prayers and the encouragement of the church here at Grace Point, we'd, we would love to pray for you. We would love to baptize you. We'd love to do anything that you need. And we invite you to come now as we stand and as we sing. died for me oh may I ever faithful be my Savior and my God I'll live for him who died for me how happy they shall be. I'll live for him who died for me, my Savior and my God. I now believe thou dost receive for Thou hast died that I might live, and now henceforth I'll trust in Thee, my Savior and my God. I'll live for Him. Died for me. How happy then my life 
Well, if you've ever had a business loan or a mortgage that you paid off, you know it's a great feeling. Uh, this is certainly a milestone for Grace Point. Our contribution today was 53828 53828 Certainly this will free up some funds for more productive uses. Yeah. On behalf of the elders, I just want to commend everyone who did extra, and we thank you. Let's stand and sing number... 709, 709, and then we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> how sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's peace delight and so fulfill the please. Our almighty and righteous Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before you today. We pray that our worship service has been acceptable and pleasing on your side. And Father, as we reflect on this past year, we know we've had some challenges that faced us to churches, individuals, with health and other financial issues. But Father, we know that <clears throat> looking back, we can see your blessings on this church and each individual here. And we're so thankful for the blessings you have provided for us. Father, as we look forward to the next coming year, we pray that you will be with us, that you will bless us with opportunities to share your word, to be a light to this community and to the world, to show Jesus in our lives. Father, we are mindful today of those that are on our prayer list that are sick, dealing with issues, and we pray there are blessings on them. We ask your blessings upon the elders, the deacons that work here. We pray for Chase and Jamie and their family and pray that you'll continue to bless them. We're so thankful that they're here. And we pray for each individual here, Father, that you bless them through this coming year and help us to, to grow and love for one another 
love for you. Father, we are so thankful for Jesus, your son. The life he lived and, and the life he gave for our benefit. <laughs> Through his name we pray, amen.